thank you. Um, my printer this morning um, either went on an unauthorized strike or was sabotaged, one of the two. Um, and so um, I'm going to um, do something which is um, unusual for me, which is to um, try to do this off of my iPad. Um, and um, it is interesting that Matt became, uh, began with the story about a nation at risk. Um, um, so to um, cement my uh, reputation as a heretic, um, I will say I think Shanker made the wrong decision about a nation at risk. Um, be that as it may, um, our topic today, teacher unions and research, um, I have phrased as knowledge and power in American education. Um, over the last three decades, the landscape of education research in the United States has been dramatically transformed. If one wants to understand how teachers and their unions read education research today, and why they read education research the way they do, it is necessary to have a solid grasp of this transformation in the terrain of educational research itself. The end of knowledge is power, Thomas Hobbes wrote. This has become a commonplace maxim of political and sociological theory, from Weber and Durkheim to Bordeaux and Foucault. Knowledge and power are woven tightly together. Educational knowledge is no exception to this rule. The production of education knowledge is a critical and central moment in the constitution of power relationships in education and in the larger society. Struggles over political, economic, and cultural power, shifting balances of power among different political, economic, and cultural forces, all are embodied and embedded in educational knowledge. An examination of the changing landscape of research in American education thus requires both a politics of educational knowledge and a sociology of educational knowledge. One particularly useful point of entry into this examination is the increasing prominence and reach of think tanks in American education. Since the mid-1980s, think tanks with a presence in education have grown in number, size, and political influence, reflecting the larger emergence of think tanks in American politics. The political science literature tells us that the development of think tanks has been ideologically asymmetrical, with conservative think tanks outnumbering by more than a three to two margin their liberal counterparts. The numbers are starker when one examines the financial resources of think tanks conservative think tanks have a better than three to one advantage. If anything, this imbalance is even starker among think tanks involved in education as they are weighted towards the larger national think tanks. And as a representative of a small think tank on the other side, I can assure you that is the case. What explains this disparity? The answer is no more complicated than the power of organized right-wing wealth. The same elements of the wealthy elite that have been behind the explosion of money supporting right-wing candidates and campaigns in the electoral process and have provided the resources driving the right-wing state and local legislative campaigns conducted, conducted out of ALEC and the state policy network appear as the patrons of high-powered conservative think tanks such as the American Enterprise Institute, the Cato Institute, and the Heritage Foundation. The Koch brothers, Michael Joyce, Michael Joyce of the Olin and Bradley Foundations, the Scaife family, the Kors family, the DeVoe family, and the Walton family are just the more prominent names among those that have been pivotal in providing financial support both to right-wing politics and to conservative think tanks with a presence in education. The countervailing forces to these incredibly large sums of right-wing money that are now flooding both the political process and the policy world, organized labor and wealthy liberals such as Soros and Steyer simply do not possess comparable financial resources. The emergence of think tanks dominated by the hard right 
has been fueled by the complementary development of a new agenda-driven educational philanthropy. The Walton Family Foundation, the Gates Foundation, the Broad Foundation and the Arnold Foundation, cooperate here, iPad, have led the way in leveraging their donations to gain advantages in educational political ba battles and to target changes in educational policy. Their giving took on the idea that education is a public good with support for the introduction of markets and market mechanisms into education and market discipline into public schools. This saw the introduction of a business model of schooling and the use of student test scores as the equivalent of a business bottom line to make high stakes decisions about the futures of schools, teachers, and students themselves. These foundations have financially supported research, which is consistent with their policy agenda. We miss the full impact of think tanks, however, if we examine only their political bent and policy agenda, as important as it is. Just as important is their structural impact on education research. By design, think tanks occupy a political and policy space at the juncture of the state, the university, the media, and the foundation. They often function as shadow governments in their policy areas, developing alternatives to official state policy, particularly when their preferred political party or political faction is not in government. At the senior level, there is an ongoing exchange of personnel between think tank ranks on the one hand and government bureaucracies and elected officials on the other hand. As a rule, entry-level researchers in think tanks come out not of an actual policy field or academic speciality, such as education, but from departments of public policy. This vantage point leads to what observers have called a technocratic worldview among think tanks, but this description only partially captures what is going on. Given their structural location, think tanks tend to, quote, see like a state, to use James Scott's formulation. The organizational logic of the state, direction, control, and change from above, from the top down, is an administrative worldview based on ruling and managing objects from a distance. Think tanks generally view the world of education through that prism. The distant objects are schools and classrooms, educators and students. The rise of think tanks has had a dual structural effect on education research. On the one hand, think tanks compete with some real success with traditional researchers in schools of education as the public voice of policy expertise on educational matters. Here, the think tank connection with the media is crucial. There is a displacement of educators as experts on matters educational, a displacement that has had its analogs in the introduction of non-educators to run school districts. On the other hand, think tanks have had a pernicious effect within the field of education itself. Academic dorms which have been abandoned by think tanks, such as the use of peer review before the publication of research, are now often ignored by those in the academy who are closest to the world of the think tank. The valuable think tank reviews published by the National Education Policy Center are just one effort to provide some counterbalance to think tank research by actually providing a form of peer review, but it is after the fact of publication. The Department of Education Reform at the University of Arkansas, established with Walmart money and populated with scholars who have adopted Walmart's policy agenda, is an extreme example of think tank influence on the academy, but is simply the most advanced wave of this development. The rise of think tanks has had a synergistic relationship with another development that has sought to displace traditional education research. Research on schools and education from other disciplines such as economics and political science that employ public choice and rational choice methodology. This development began to first take shape with the 1990 publication of Chubbs and Moe's Politics markets and America's schools. 
Now, education has always been enriched by studies from other disciplines, going back to Plato and Confucius. John Dewey himself brought the insights of philosophy and politics to his study of pedagogy. But in that rich tradition of Plato to duty, these thinkers actually engaged the real world of teaching and learning, of real classrooms and real schools. What marks the current body of work from public choice economics and rational choice political science is the refusal to engage the world of teaching and learning and the refusal to engage education research itself. Rather, this body of work operates from a seeing like a state paradigm, reducing the rich and thick complexity of different learning relationships and communities to a few statistics, which can then can be compared to similar numbers from other learning communities. Moreover, the versions of public choice and rational choice methodologies that are employed here are ones that bring inside of their modeling assumptions about human nature, about how and why human beings act, about the superiority of markets that predispose them to the privatization of public goods. Little surprise then that this body of work invariably finds the market as the answer to every question. How then do teacher unions view education research in this context? Teacher unions are unions of educators. One doesn't get to be a leader of a teacher union without having worked in schools. And so they view it first and primarily through the lens of an educator. And they understand that what has happened to education research is not separate from but part of what has been happening to their schools and to their classrooms. And so teacher unions view educational research with a critical lens. We do not swoon when Terry Moe or Carolyn Hoxby or Jay Green announce that education research says that vouchers have been proven to be more efficient than public school. Teachers are educated um, individuals, and teacher unions represent that educated class of people. And so when we come to the world of education research, we understand exactly what has happened over the course of time and where we stand in relationship to it. That does not mean that teacher unions do not use education research and do not look to it for insight. I think an important example in this respect is what has happened over the last 10 years around issues of student discipline. Many years ago, when, when student discipline went to a zero tolerance phase, um, teacher unions were supportive. They saw this as a way of creating a safe environment in which all students could learn and they thought that that was obviously a prerequisite for a meaningful education. But the education research that has looked at that question over the intervening time has shown that what happened in the zero tolerance policy um, was a policy that would disproportionately impacted uh, students of color, particularly black and brown boys, and showed that um, what was happening was that suspensions and expulsions were being used in an excessive fashion um, which made it possible, made it impossible for students to get the education that they needed. So teacher unions in that context, using that research, drawing upon that research, have changed the way that we look at student discipline and have a, have a, a, a now an entirely different um, reform attitude. So there is a place for teacher unions to use educational research, but we do so critically looking at the field in all of its complexities and what has happened to it over the last 30 years. <laughs>